Uh, thank you very much, uh, Carl, for your kind words and introduction. It's uh, my pleasure to be here and have this opportunity to uh, meet with uh, Chinese students of Heidegger, I hope, in some way. Um, I will do my presentation. I will share my uh, text uh, so you can read with me. might be uh, a good uh, way of doing it. Uh, of course, after my presentation, you can uh, ask me questions about the presentation. Also, other questions about Martin Heidegger, if you have some uh, other things that you're interested in. I hope we'll have a, a good couple of hours uh, together and uh, it will bring something for us. I'm sharing my uh, text and all that. In reading it, I, I changed the title a little bit, but it's the same thing. Yeah. Learning technology. Uh, I would like to start with a letter that Heidegger wrote to his friend Carl Jaspers on July 1st, 1935. And in this letter he writes, for me it is, talk about it, a difficult groping progress. Only a few months ago that I could pick up the work was abandoned in the winter of 1932. Heidegger had to be, uh, that winter semester, uh, he was free of the teaching duties, so he could spend his time on his own work. But it is a thin stuttering, and furthermore, the two thorns, the confrontation with the faith of my proponent, my rectorship, gave me just enough to do with that which I would really like. And citation. We must consider the reference to the Pauline formulation of the thorn in the flesh, as well as the entire page. Even if it's always risky, it's close to philosopher's thinking on the basis of statements in private letters. This passage, when put into context, in the right context, seems very telling. Heidegger wrote this letter in the summer of 1934. Two minutes earlier in April, he had publicly resigned as rector. The actual work, the interpretation of pre-Socratic thinking and the question of the origins of metaphysics due to, a possible, to the possible development of what Heidegger still called the new metaphysics at the time, interrupted by political events in the winter of 1932-33. So of course, the rise to power of the movement in Germany. In winter semester 1934-35, Heidegger gave his first lecture course on Hölderlin. In 1935 and 1936, he gave a lecture, gave a lecture on the origin of the work of art several times. In summer semester 1935, he gave a lecture course on introduction to metaphysics, a course that he would publish much later, probably in the 1950s. Immediately at the beginning of this lecture course, we find the following important indication. Heidegger says, all essential questioning in philosophy necessarily remains untimely. And this is because philosophy either projects far beyond its own time or else binds its time back to this time's earlier and inceptive. Any problem? For some reason. A completely different tone he uses here compared to his addresses and lectures during the time of the lecturer. Remarkable. Where, for example, he wrote in his letter to the teachers in 1937, 1933, the construction of a new spiritual world. German people will become an essential future task of the German university. This is national labor of the highest order and meaning. In order to properly assess Heidegger's past life and thinking after the lecture, must be two things. After the failure of the rectorate, he continues to work on a new metaphysics. In his Schelling and Nietzsche lecture courses in 1936 and 1940, he will come to the insight that traditional metaphysics has found its culmination and completion in nihilism. In 1936, Heidegger started writing his famous contributions to philosophy, included in deals with the elaboration of the history of being. Two, it's particularly striking, however, that his philosophy is no longer about the German people and the present, primarily about the few, the wenige, to whom a distant future. 
However, what does the confrontation with the face region of my profile with the face of my profile mean in the quoted passage from its letter to Jasper? To go up the opinion that by the face of my provenance, Heidegger means Catholicism. This seems unlikely to me, however, because Heidegger no longer considered himself a Catholic in 1919. Since then, like Husserl, he understood himself as a free, non-confessional Christian. The face of his provenance does not mean Catholicism here, Christianity. I come to an end with death of God, diagnosed. What, however, would take the place of Christianity? Because from being in time, on Heidegger considers his death to be the last stage of the forgetfulness of being. In this way, the relationship emphasized by Heidegger between the face of his origin and the failure of the rector becomes clear. He believed that as rector, he had done everything in his power, worked for the construction of a new spiritual world for the German people. This project failed miserably due to the lack of university reform and his misreading of the political situation. Another reason, however, was that Heidegger had very closely linked the possibility of building a new spiritual world with the possibility of a new metaphysics. In the years immediately following his rectorate, and as a result of his Nietzsche, many years, it slowly came to the realization that such a metaphysics is impossible here in the years of the Nazi dictatorship, followed by the Second World War, may have been decisive in Heidegger's further life, therefore in important biographical events. In contact with many friends and students, Aaron Jaspers, Larry Kadamer, to name the most of them, and often travel opportunities. Although Heidegger was able to go to Rome in 1936 to give two lectures. In Rome, he met Carl Lewitt again. In July 1935, the pastor Dorothea Erika Bühler, the niece of Elfriede, was taken into the family of Heidegger. Her parents had died in a car crash in Brazil. A friend of Elfriede's, Erika Semmler, was active in the National Socialist Women's Movement and a guest of Martin and Elfriede in September. Erika Semmler had good contacts in Berlin in the political circles there and was aware of the latest political developments. She informed them both about the imminent war. This is why Heidegger began to bring his manuscripts to safety in Meskis in the autumn of 1938. After all, Freiburg is located directly on the German French border. His brother Fritz may have first made a type of script, have carbon copies of the contributions of what he had been that over the year many times. Nowadays, we can precisely trace the development of Heidegger's thinking on the way of the Gandalf town. But with this abundance of material, we run the risk of losing ourselves in part. The limitation to Heidegger's published writings justifies me for that reason and also makes it possible to deny the most important milestone. In addition, Heidegger rejected an edition of his collected works until 1933. In this lecture, I will deal with the problem of nihilism, the question of the essence of technology and the task of new metaphysics. First, I will discuss Heidegger's contribution to the commemorative volume for Ernst Jünger's 60th birthday. It was published later separately on the Then focus my attention briefly on the famous lecture, the question concerning technology, and finally go over his famous Meskirch lecture. So, the lecture is Nietzsche and Jünger. When you talk about Jünger, you also talk about Nietzsche. Pindle already cited a letter to Jaspers. Heidegger speaks of two songs, provenance and the failure. Nietzsche came to the horrifying discovery. The confrontation with the belief of provenance relates to this. The failure of the structures relates to the unsuccessful of a new metaphysics. Nietzsche, as Heidegger had seen in the later half of the 1930s, had completed metaphysics and thus revealed the necessity of a different way of thinking. We find these two themes in Heidegger's 1930. Heidegger calls his contribution, and I'm quoting here, an assessment of our situation concerned with crossing the line. We'll be clear what that means. 
Unger sees the current era as the completion of nihilism because everything pushes towards nothing. The line is the zero meridian and forms the boundary between two eras, that of completed nihilism before 1950 and that of a new turn to its being. Like Nietzsche, Junger looks for the possibility of a transition, liberation from the era of nihilism. While Junger tries to cross the line, leave the era of completed nihilism behind. Heidegger is more cautious. He doesn't want to speak over meta, but rather of the linear. Here we have already found the decisive point. Junger has adopted Nietzsche's view of the metaphysics of the will to power in order to make really reality visible towards the end. His famous book, The Work of Dominion and Kerschnei, the Arbeiter, Herrschaft und Kerschnei, from 1932 belongs to the phase of active nihilism. In an autobiographical passage, Heidegger explains that in the winter of 1939, he discussed the book in a small circle of his university team. What he keeps silent about, however, is that he also did this immediately after the publication. In 1933, he followed Jünger in his attempt to free the German people from nihilism. We can also read the critique of Jünger presented on the question of being as a self-critique of Heidegger. Jung had made reality after the First World War visible from Nietzsche's perspective as the new normal state of humanity. That is his great achievement, that already made a great impression in Heidegger in 1933. He also, like Nietzsche, had tried to bring about a new turn of Dasein with being. Übermensch appears in Jung's work in the Gestalt Worker. In 1933, Heidegger still believed that by revolutionizing the whole of German Dasein, he could bring the German people to a new turn. Revolution was the condition of possibility of the development of a new metaphysics. Heidegger's discovery in the years after his rector is that nihilism is the completion of metaphysics. And that is why a new metaphysics has become when Nietzsche still stood on the bridge and as a teacher could only point to the end, Jünger was of the opinion that he could cross. He made two serious mistakes to result. First, <laughs> Nietzsche had completed the history of metaphysics through his metaphysics of the will to power. You have to even mention the return of eternal recurrence. He is the last metaphysician and proclaimer. Jünger adopts Nietzsche's metaphysic, describes his own time from his, from this perspective without realizing that he has this perspective. Nietzsche's metaphysics is not understood by him, but is considered to be, as he says, self-evident, seemingly superfluous. From the mid-1930s, Heidegger has tried to interpret the history of metaphysics from its beginning or inception to its completion in order to show that metaphysics had unfolded its last possibility in the It's not only in his inaugural lecture in 1929 that Heidegger raises the question, what is metaphysics? But also in his rectoral address of 1930. Second, Jünger uses not only Nietzsche's perspective, that is the metaphysics of the will to power, Time, he also uses this perspective to describe the realm on the other side of the bridge. In other words, he speaks the same language. So, here, the position of nihilism is, it seems, already rel relinquished in a certain way by crossing over the line. But its language has remained. And quote. Heidegger rightly emphasizes Jünger's thinking remains because the mode of vision that determines his thinking belongs to the form of the Platonic idea. It remains, as Heidegger says, housed within made of The figure of the worker as a new stroke of man, no, Gestalt of man, is the Gestalt of humanity that Jünger assumes as given and has described and interpreted in his writing. In this way, he has, discovered, he has discovered the ultimate subjective, which is the completion of modern subjective. 
he uses the concept the subject subjectivity is the ground that lies beneath and is expressed subjectivity has come to light in the figure of other two as both person of Nietzsche's and in the gestalt of the worker in Jung's writings according to Heidegger it's on the one hand to Jung's merit that he understood the gestalt of modern human being as a sort of meaning this made it possible for Jünger to experience and understand work as the total character of the reality of the real. Work is the final form of the will to power and its completion in total. This means that not only nature is used as material for labor, but also a human being is mobilized as a worker. Heidegger's later interpretation of the essence of technology, I'll talk about it later, presupposes Jünger's and Nietzsche's experience of total mobilization. On the other hand, it is the limitation of human thinking that he has not questioned, questioned his own concepts and perspective. Heidegger can actually refer here to his critique of Jaspers in his book, Psychology of Worldviews, that he wrote uh, in, uh, around 1920. Both Jaspers and Jünger never asked the question, the condition, the possibility, perspective. Heidegger has remained true to his phenomenological perspective. And I get to the matter itself that he worked out in the 1920s. Yeah. On the other hand, use of language. Jung's understanding of language is problematic from Heidegger's perspective. On the one hand, there is the objective reality to which language is related. On the other hand, there is the language that to comprehend objective reality. Just like modern metaphysics and science. Junger objectifies reality for being, being. Reality is, as you know, challenged to show itself within the perspective by representing grasp. Just when we think that we have a grip on reality, so our representation, reality unexpectedly shows, as in quantum field, that it is and will remain independent of our representation of it. The concepts that Jünger uses, such as form, dominion, will, value, certainty, and nothing, basic metaphysical concepts. These concepts should all be questions, and we should ask always, with Heidegger, whether they are still suitable for making the matter itself visible. Jünger has never seen this problem. It now becomes even more urgent, that we should not be speaking a completely different and new language the other side of the prison. But Jünger tries to understand the essence of completed nihilism. Heidegger reflects on the essence of nihilism. After 1933, Heidegger came to understand over the course of a decade that nihilism is the completion of metaphysics. Metaphysics has become a titanic, titanic battle over the question and the sense of being and finds its completion in the experience that today being is nothing more. The question concerning the essence of being dies off if it does not relinquish the language of metaphysics, because metaphysical representation prevents us from thinking the question concerning the essence. We could have also the question concerning the essence of technology. Here, Heidegger comes to a decisive insight we can understand more easily if we take a step back through. From 1919 to 1945, Heidegger interpreted the history of philosophy as the history of metaphysics in his lecture courses and seminars. As a private tutor and as a soldier who had just been released from the service he had tried on the basis of his, of his experience of crisis, to understand the end of the First World War, as a break and the definite end of the long 19th century to reshape. The phenomenology of Dasein should make possible the foundation of a new ontology, new self-understanding of Dasein. This is the beginning of the project, Being in Time, the first elaboration in the book, Being in Time. 
One of its most important insights was the discovery of forgetfulness. Being in time, Heidegger again poses the question of being has been forgotten since Plato and Aristotle. Between 1927 and 1933, Heidegger discovers a break between the thinking of the early Greek thinkers and the metaphysics starting with Socrates and Plato and the Dawkins and Nietzsche's diagnosis of nihilism. First, he works on a new metaphysics, and Black Humor and Nietzsche tries to cross the bridge to a new domain. He discovers, after his failed attempt to educate the German people to a metaphysical people during the crisis of 1934, is that the beginning of metaphysics, which is conception, is also the beginning of nihilism. This makes the new metaphysics meaningless and never. The essence of metaphysics is the forgetfulness of being, and therefore in metaphysics, it only comes to light in its completion. It is nothing with being. The beginning of Greek thought is the understanding of being, which has found the very culture its first form in the meditative, contemplative thinking, the zine of the early Greek poets and thinkers. That is to say, for Heidegger, Homer, Pindar, Sophocles, and Aeschylus, Anaximander, Parmenides, and of course, Herod. Plato and Aristotle, the first philosophers, and are still at home in the tradition, but have developed the experience of being as the question of being of being. Thus begins the history of metaphysics, being us, being. She no longer dwells in the experience of being. And every answer to the question unfolds according to being. This was not a mistake of the philosophers, an appropriation. Heidegger can then interpret the history of metaphysics as the history of being. This history shows how being is increasingly destroyed. The forgetfulness and abandonment of being are two sides of the same coin. It is important to remember that the experience of the withdrawal of being is not possible until the age of completed nihilism. Forgetfulness of being is the result of the consumment of being. The withdrawal. That is. This is so, we can only experience when we get involved in the essence of nihilism. In other words, Heidegger goes a step further than Jünger, who only described completed nihilism, that is, at the same time, nihilistically. The forgetfulness of being, condition of possibility of metaphysics, in the other side of the mystery of being. The Greek word, aletheia, according to Heidegger, means unconcealment. Unconcealment is the first determination of being, and in the unconcealment, being comes to light in early Greek thinking as the meaning of being studied. As soon as being reveals itself as beingness, it conceals itself at the same time. This is the appropriation of the rightness. The history of being begins and unfolds as the history of forgetfulness of being. That is why Heidegger sees the return to the beginning or inception of Greek thought, the only way to move beyond metaphysics. Because according to Heidegger, we can survey the issue of energy. Completed in nihilism, we can return to the origins of metaphysics. Even if we are only dwarfs on the shoulders of Plato and Aristotle, our historical experience makes it possible to have a wider view of the search for death, which is not yet in the meditative thinking. It is precisely here that we can experience the essence of metaphysics. Heidegger then says, in accordance with this performance, metaphysics as metaphysics remains prevented from ever experiencing its essence. For it is within the surpassing and for it, the being of beings shows itself through metaphysical representation. Appearing in this way expressly makes its claim upon metaphysical representation. No wonder metaphysical representation rebels against the thought that it moves within the oblivion of being. So, uh, okay. In metaphysics, the idea of the forgetfulness of being is incomprehensible and always will be. She asks about the being beings. The fact that the question of the sense of being turns into the question of being us 
conditional possibility of metaphysics and the consequence of human being. Heidegger should actually speak of the forgetfulness of being metaphysics, because being, as he often writes it in the, from the little myth, in the own, the sign of its epsilon, feels itself as far as it reveals itself, being of beings. The merit of Nietzsche and Jünger is that they have described nihilism as the final phase of the history of the Western uh, civilization, Europe and the US. However, because they remained metaphysicians in their thinking and language, they cannot overcome nihilism. They both immediately want to cross the line. Heidegger is much more careful than before. In order to prepare for the possibility of overcoming metaphysics, entire history must first be destructed. That is retrieved and interpreted. Only through this retrieval can the path to another beginning be indicated as a possibility. This indication remains pretty formal. Heidegger has remained a phenomenologist all his life, although he has given up on it. But a non metaphysical thinking is meditative. Zeno, which is one of the terms I uses. He uses other ones as well. So now I come to the question concerning technology. In his famous lecture on the question concerning technology, he wants to guide his audience on a path. Through his question, he wants to establish a free relationship with technology that is to give it the possibility to show itself in its essence, reason. Essence, in Heidegger's sense, that which pervades beings in their being, and not a platonic idea or the what of a being. The essence of the tree is that which pervades in all trees, it is itself not a tree. The essence of technology is also nothing technological. So how can we experience our relation to technology in a free way? Heidegger begins, as he often does, by rejecting traditional accounts of what technology is. One says, here, technology is a means to an end. The other says, technology is a human activity. Technology is thus understood as an instrument, the use of human beings. But is modern technology not different than you? I could give a few examples. He says, even the power plant, turbines, and generator, is a man made means to an end. Even the jet aircraft, frequency apparatus, means to an end. A radio station is, of course, less simple than a weather fane. To be sure, the construction of a high frequency apparatus requires the interlocking of various processes called industrial production. Certainly, a sawmill in the secluded valley of the Black Forest is a primitive means compared with the hydroelectric plant in the Rhine River. But this much remains correct. Modern technology is the means to an end. Unquote. The self evident conception of technology leads to the misguided notion that man is the master of technology. In this will to master technology, the will to power. After discussing the four ways of being responsible, responsible for bringing something forth, Heidegger discusses the true meaning of bringing forth. It is not just making things like shoes, not just works of art, but futures. It's also what is it? Plato tells us what his bringing is, bringing forth is in a sentence in poetry. Every occasion, Plato says, or whatever passed over and brought forward into presencing from that which is not present, presencing is what is it? Is bringing forth. End of However, bringing force comes to power only insofar as something concealed comes into unconcealment. This coming rests and moves freely within what Heidegger calls revealing. We can now go on and say, and quote him again, technology is therefore no mere means. Technology is a way of revealing. If we give heed to this, then another whole realm for the essence of technology will open itself up to us. This realm of revealing is truth. The word technology comes from the Greek 
tech, technicon. Technicon belongs to techno. Heidegger goes on to explain that techno comprehends both the skill and knowledge of the craftsman and the arts of the mind and the family. But what is even more important is that techno and techno are related as ways this knowing knows how to bring something forward and thus reveal it. Tekne is thus also a mode of aletaria. That is, that, but it is there in this respect. But is there in this respect the difference between techne and modern technology? On the Heidegger, there is. And he says, what is modern technology? It too is a revealing. Only when we allow our attention to rest on this fundamental characteristic, does that which is new in modern technology show itself to us? Yet the revealing that holds sway throughout modern technology does not unfold into a bringing forth in the sense of poetry. The revealing that rules in modern technology is a challenging, it asks for them, which puts to, na to nature the unreasonable demand that it's my energy it can be extracted in the world. But, and the Heidegger can now disclose the essence of modern technology in two ways. One, it always sets upon stealth, and in the manifold ways of setting upon it, it is enframing. Thus, the German prefix ke is always a collecting different kinds of stelle, positing, vorstelle, nachstelle, etc. And two, in enframing, technology reveals the real, a standing reserve. Understand. And framing is the gathering together that belongs to that setting upon which man is in position to reveal the real in the mode of ordering. An example of it is uh, in the warehouse of Amazon, where everything is uh, ordered so it can be delivered to the customers. As one whose challenge falls in this way, man stands within the essential realm of enframing and never take up a relationship with knowledge subsequently. Thus, the question as to how we are to arrive at the relationship, essence of technology, asking this way, always comes too late. But never too late comes the question as to whether we actually, as the ones whose activities everywhere, public and private, are challenged forth and framing above all. Never too late comes the question as to whether and how we actually are in and framing itself. Basically, the idea is that through and framing, we ourselves become in frame and are no longer the ones who are doing the framing to come apart. I find that in the English expression, we thought what the human beings are only disclosed as a means for use in an uh, in either of the machines or uh, also in the banking or the stock, etc. Directing is what Heidegger calls kashik. Here is interpretation of the history of metaphysics nihilism, planetary dominance of technology. It's this destining of metaphysics, both Western man in metaphysics. In this sense, technology is the fate of our age. And so decisively in the tendency to enframing that we no longer see enframing. We do not grasp that we are, we are spoken to through this claim that no longer can understand tech. Um, almost way of being. And framing reduces our revealing of the being of beings, ordering them in standing reserve. And finally, we ourselves become part of standing, like I said, called Heidegger one more time here. The rule of enframing threatens man with the possibility that it could be denied to him, entering into a more original revealing, and hence to experience the more primal. Thus, where enframing reigns, there is danger highest sense. But where danger is gross, so which is a quote from Hilda Lund. 
But how can we find the saving power within the essence of modern technology? What if there might be a more primarily granted revealing that could bring the saving power into its first shining force in the midst of danger? Revealing that in the technological, rather conceals than shows its such a realm as art. Art belongs to the constellation of truth. If we question truth as unconcealment, we may come to the insight that in our shared preoccupation with technology, we do not yet experience the coming to presence of technology. That in our sheer aesthetic mindedness, we no longer guard and preserve the coming to presence of art. Yet the more questioningly we ponder the essence of technology, the more mysterious the essence of art becomes. In this sense, Heidegger can end his lecture on a note. Yes. The closer we come to the more brightly to the ways into the what we can become. And the more questioning we become. So questioning is Frank is the for me. Right. So Heidegger, the ceremony speech, memorial address, last night, in honor of the Messkirche composer, Lundin Kreutzler, 1780. On October 30th, 1955, Messkirche, special event. Since his youth lectures in Messkirche as a theology and later a philosophy student, he had no longer spoken publicly in his hometown. He had only accepted the invitation of Mayor Schuller on the condition that he could choose the theme of his address. It goes without saying that Heidegger did not want to give a normal memorial speech. An important part of the festivities was taken up by the performance of music, in addition to choral songs, also opera and chamber music. Thus, the composer was celebrated as an artist and music movement. As always, almost always, Heidegger begins his musings. Question. But does that make the ceremony memorial? Is the ceremony through play and song already a memorial ceremony? A ceremony in which we think? Probably, hardly. At first sight, Heidegger seems to be some kind of carry on the cake. Famous philosopher son of the town should add a bit of thinking to the celebrations, so the ceremony would become a real kadenk thinking. Heidegger could have thought interesting things about Kreutz's life and work. There would only be a form of entertainment, but thinking. Only when an address invites us to meditate on something, a thinking ceremony guarantee that we will, that we will be thinking at some point during the celebration. Thinking is only possible when I actualize my thinking myself. If I do not think myself, there is no thinking for me or through me. Meditative thinking, the Zeno, is a formal indication. Thinking means to meditate on something that, as I guess, concerns each and every one of us immediately and continuously in our essence. Human beings are, in other words, thinking. Heidegger does not mean with this formal indication that Dasein is the animal rationale or the animal that has reason for noon. Today, in the age of completed nihilism, often poor of thought, or even worse, thought. Heidegger says, thoughtlessness is an uncanny guest. When the present goes in and out, this uncanny guest is a symptom of nihilism. For this reason, thoughtlessness Kenny, not the uncanniest of all that you find in because metaphysics was completed in nihilism. Planetary dominance of technology. There are no further possibilities of metaphysical thinking more. We could call it the poverty. Heidegger can now guide his audience on two different paths of thinking. The first one is the question: what calls for thinking? The other one is the question concerning the essence of technology. Let's follow Heidegger on the first part. In being and time, Heidegger had uncovered an implicit understanding of being of human beings in his existential analytic of Dasein. Without thinking, there can be no human. 
thinking in its simplest form, understanding of being, being in truth. Human beings are always already in their Dasein, engaged with beings. The history of metaphysics is the human answer to this being. In Dasein, it's always addressed by beings. But what? But when at the end, the history of metaphysics is in nihilism, being does not concern us anymore. Dasein threatens to lose its understanding of being. Thus, it's Therefore, the danger and distress of temporary Dasein is great. Right here. Again. Today you take note of everything and everything in the fast, the deepest way, and at the same moment you've forgotten it just as quick. Written in 1955, and if you think there was no internet at the time, for example, it was <laughs> there was time in some ways. Heidegger wrote this sentence in 1955. Today computers, the internet, and smartphones make everything so much quicker. In phenomena like these, the increasing thoughtlessness comes. Heidegger says, today, man is fleeing. This means that in thinking is the determination and destiny of Dasein, that the day Dasein is fleeing for itself. It may help to think about nihilism here. The completion of metaphysics in nihilism shows itself in Dasein losing its understanding of being. This loss is both a consequence of contemporary Dasein forgetfulness of being and forgettingheit, and the abandonment of being. These two phenomena are intertwined and mirror each other. It would be easy to contradict Heidegger and point out that never in the history of humanity there, were so much, there was so much research and planning. Are research and planning not forms of thinking? Is this not a refutation of Heidegger's thesis? It may seem to be the case. We should keep in mind that Heidegger makes an all-important distinction between two forms of calculative, rechnendes thinking, meditative, besinnliches thinking. Research and planning are two specific forms of thinking that never stops and therefore never finds rest. Calculative thinking will never find insistent inständigkeit and does not know how to wait. Medit Thinking, on the other hand, meditates on and seeing that prevails, vaulted, everything that is. We are now able to understand the greatest danger of nihilism. When all that remains is calculative thinking, meditative thinking is lost. Dasein will lose its essence. Dasein can only calculate. It will no longer be able to overcome the planetary dominance of technology because any other form of thinking will no longer be possible. The Greeks distinguish five ways of being in truth. In the Wahrheit sign, truth, reason, Sophia, wisdom, and knowledge, from the sis, prudence, and Heidegger has shown in his many interpretations how interpretations how in the course of the history of metaphysics, techne, technology has become more and more the only valid way of discovering entities in their being. Technology, of course, belongs to the essence of human being, uh, that human beings would not be able to exist. Heidegger is not opposed to technology, but he sees in the planetary domination of technology the danger that Dasein would slowly lose all of its other ways of discovering the being of beings. Finally, it may no longer be human. One of the dangers of reading Heidegger's text is that we proceed quickly. He developed and structured his essays and conferences always very precisely as possible and tries to lead a step. When we follow Heidegger and understand his distinction between calculative and meditative, we could ask what the meaning of meditative thinking may be. Calculative thinking is easy to grasp and can present us with endless research results. Meditative thinking, that is the kind of thinking Dasein flees from, seemingly only floats above reality and is of no importance whatsoever to our daily practical life. And furthermore, Meditative thinking is simply too high and difficult for a normal person. For us today, Heidegger's path of thinking is maybe easier to follow than for the people from his hometown who heard him speak in mind. Natural science has become even more the measure of all forms of knowledge. As Heisenberg said, only what is calculable can be real. In academics, the humanities should follow the method of quantification. Medicine, law, architecture, biology, technology, 
etc., are the sciences that are of immediate use to human beings and can make life better and easier. We also like to be in control and rely on certainties in life. Insurance was example, invented in the 17th century. Everything should be foreseeable and makeable. If you don't like what you see in the mirror, a plastic surgeon may be able to help. A bit of art every now and then, not too much, mind you. But for our well-being, we should spend some money on the arts. Why would we need? The question in itself shows how technological our self-understanding has become. In other words, we need meditative thinking now more than ever. Meditative thinking is for contemporary Dasein so useful, while, while it is absolutely useless. Heidegger can easily refute objections that meditative thinking is beyond the of ordinary people. Firstly, science also demands training, study, and endeavor. If you want to understand the, the theory of relativity, it will take you a while to figure it out. For common sense, scientific theories are no more understandable than pure meditative thinking. But Heidegger here calls meditative thinking is basically still the phenological approach to the meditative self. The being can only show itself when we let it free to show itself from itself as itself. This implies that we should try not to order everything within a form of objectivity, time, movement, space, nature, life. Listen to what each being has to say. To learn how to think meditatively takes a lot of effort and training. In his lecture courses and seminars, Heidegger tried to teach it to is how to let beings be so that they can show themselves from themselves that they are themselves. This made his teaching so exciting. After 1945, he tried to show his audience in one or two hours. It was a matter, Sacher, he discussed. And how to see it, as it was. Everybody can learn to think. Even human beings, since human beings are the thinking, is meditating in on the beings. When we are thinking meditatively, we only need to linger and dwell with that which is close to us and meditate on it. In German, nach naliegende zu verweilen und uns auf das nächstliegende. Auf das, was uns jeden einzelnen hier und jetzt angeht. This step enables Heidegger to come to the matter of this address. What concerns us here and now? What is closest to it? The simple fact that from this, from his native soil, the work of art grew. We could expect Heidegger to start talking about music as art now. However, he chooses a different path. He becomes thoughtful, he says, in art. Doesn't to all forms of flourishing, solid and tasteful the work, the rooting in native soil, the wurzeling in Boden, by the Heimat, belong. Becoming meditative means concentrating on that which is worthy to be questioned. I agree with you. And when we concentrate on the questionable, the question concerning our rootedness, the needs to be. It is typical of Heidegger's method. He now cites a poet. Language still speaks in the work of the poet. And when we learn to listen to it, close to the phenomenon, it shows itself in language. The citation that he uses is from Johann Peter Hebel. John Peter Hebel once wrote, we are plants that, we like to admit it or not, have to rise with the roots out of the earth in order to be able to bloom in the ether and bear fruits. Heidegger discusses this sentence in this paragraph. It's typical of his method. He says, the poet wants to say, wherever truly joyful and wholesome human work is to flourish, men must be able to rise from the depths of the native soil. He discusses the sentence and says that the poet John Peter Hebel wants to say, but didn't say, or better left than said. Hebel does not use the word human work, he talks about fruits. These fruits are the works of humans, not only works of art, but also things in the wide sense of the world that is everything that humans build and make. Next, Heidegger says, Eater means here the free air of the high sky, the open realm of the spirit. Heidegger interprets the eater as open. In his lecture, Building Dwelling Thinking, he had already discovered this, this openness as the fourfold. The fourfold of sky and earth and gods and mortals belong together in an original unity. The first two of the fourfold find in the Hebel citation. Either is 
by the speaks about the earth. But he did not notice in a tension between the two. In his view, either an earth is a static phenomenon without inner movement. Therefore, we should become even more thoughtful. Human beings dwell beneath between the sky and the earth of more. Well, as he said in Being in Time, no one can take the other's dying away from him. Dying is something that every does are in itself mistaken for itself at the time. But the very essence, death is in every case mine, so far as it is at all. Being human means being mortal. As mortals, we are finite beings. Finitude can only be thought in opposition to the infinite and immortality. In other words, as finite being, we always already have a relation to death, but goes beyond affinity. Formally indicated, region is what Heidegger calls the God. The earth in which we are rooted belongs to our native land, Heimat, that it may offer us rootedness, but it doesn't have to. The native land is the formal indication of the fourth, and only in the fourth form may human beings dwell poetically. Dwelling poetically means to be capable of death. Especially in the years after the World War II, many German people lost, as I guess said, their neighbor. The sentence is revealing in two ways. Firstly, when we pay attention in Heidegger to at what is happening today, and we see that ever more people become mortals, and people lose their native land, they lose their essence, dwelling in the forefront of the Dasein. It's secondly revealing that Heidegger only mentions German people. Not only German people were expelled, but also Russians, French, not to mention Auschwitz. Later. In homelessness, Heimat Lusica, the threat to groundedness. Groundedness is a formal indication, not a rule, metaphor. Even when Heidegger never left the province, he thought beyond the borders and limits into the free and open. Rootedness for Wurzelung belongs to Dada. He is the ground on which we continuously Dasein is a being beyond itself, in and always already with. Dasein is always already beyond itself, with that. Instead of rootedness, we could use the formal indication. Human beings stand out in that and transcend as inches. This da is the essence of truth, based in the Wahrheit. It is being as a whole for appropriating event directly. The appropriating event is the way in which human beings are addressed in as far as they exist in the whole of being. The appropriating event is fact, since we can only accept it and not question it further in the Frage. It has always already happened. Then there are people or Dasein. This is the reason why the loss of rootedness is going to Heidegger the greatest danger and the most need of our time. Heidegger gladly uses this, but we should not let ourselves be let astray and stay sober. The gravest danger is the danger we can't avoid, and the most pressing need is the need of the good. But we can only accept the serenity of Lassenheit and prepare ourselves through remembrance, undenker, for a new call of being. Why this is so, we can understand when we follow Heidegger further on this path of thinking. Our time is the age of the threat of losing our rootedness and therewith our essence. With Heidegger, we could ask what is actually happening in our time characterized. Heidegger uses the 1955 common expression atomic age, but we could call it also the age of completed nihilism. The atomic age is also the age of the flight of time for thinking, but it's lacking in the discussion of atomic age meditation. Only when we ask with Heidegger how it's possible that scientific technology discovered nuclear energy and made it usable, can we take the next step. The beginning of modernity with the radical revolution of the medieval worldview that found its clearest expression in the fundamental metaphysical position of Descartes is as in also the beginning of the age of nihilism. Descartes determined the human place in the world of being, in its relation to being, in a radically new way. And he says, now the world appears like an object which calculating thinking sets its attacks which nothing should be able to withstand anymore. Nature becomes one gigantic gas station, source of energy for modern technology and industry. The power hidden in modern technology determines the relationship between those and that. What is? And 
Heger's working is memorial dress at two levels. On the surface, he makes his audience aware of the most important. Appearance forms of the new place of Dasein within the whole being. His descriptions are current and much has only come to light fully after 60 years or 70 years in the meantime. The World Wide Web didn't exist then. Also an example of how ambiguous the tests of natural science and modern technology are. On the one hand, the internet connects people worldwide, change our lives for good, and where it will lead to, nobody knows. Communication is now instant and worldwide. On our screens, we can watch what is happening now 20,000 miles away from here like you are watching me. In every subject matter, we can find an infinite amount of information. On the other hand, we have become totally dependent on addicted to the internet and can no longer live without it. This change happened in a few decennia. The everyday consumer can't live without this functioning machinery. Because as soon as something no longer functions properly, or powerless. Heidegger shows that modern technology is not only an aid of human beings, but also takes hold of them and changes them in their essence. Today, we begin to notice how much the internet changes. We write differently, we read differently, ebooks, we make love differently, sexualization, writing, and so forth. For now, it's not important how we value these changes. Infinity of available information makes knowledge impossible. Simply, simply because we know something doesn't mean we know something. Being acquainted with, kenna, and knowing, kenna, are two different ways of being in truth. Gaining information is easy. Obtaining knowledge is hard work. The major problem is that today we are acquainted with many things we know nothing about. Heidegger talks about a power that is hidden within modern technology. It lies behind the normal forms of experience of modern technology. But what power is it? This power was contrary to all machines and automata installations and equipment not man-made. Its power holds human being within its power and is, as we have seen above, built the power that only wants itself. The completion of metaphysics in nihilism also shows itself in the phenomenon that life now is in the hands of biochemists. It breaks down and builds up and changes the living substance of the world. Something that's developed a lot more over the last 50 years. Heidegger saw things in 1955 that only became apparent Year later. Gene and uh, biotechnology pose important ethical questions. Human beings are at least partly makeable. This is only possible when he makes himself into an object, unless an object surrenders himself to technology. Nowadays, we try to ban illness, technology, corona, pandemic is an example. It would be too easy to say that we only battle illness technol technologically without promoting health. But we can't deny we find it ever more difficult to illness and death that belong to the essence of life and human being. Being human means being capable of being healthy and being ill. That modern technology changed the world in many ways is clear. But Heidegger as a feminologist, as a feminologist, sees something else in deciding. However, what is really uncanny is not that the world is becoming a thoroughly technical. It remains far more uncanny that man is not prepared for this world change. We are not yet able to think contemplatively and come to an appropriate discussion of what is actually coming up in this age. In this age. And only in his, also in his memorial address, Heidegger is convinced that we need the Ubermensch. This was already a topic in his rectoral address in 1933, and in his interpretation, he was a worker in whose Nietzsche Satrus, I asked concerning the Ubermensch. The important difference is that Heidegger in 1933-34 that we can make the Ubermensch. In 1955, he does better. The will to power lies hidden within the essence of technology. This is the reason why any attempt to master technology is still an increase of will to power. Heidegger's new Ubermensch should not do anything but learn how to let things be. This Ubermensch is a human being that crosses the bridge of thinking of another kind of thinking that may allow us to find another relation to Heidegger has always insisted the essence of physics is nothing physical, that the essence of technology is not a thing technical, and that the essence of human being is nothing human. This means that physics can't answer the question what is physics? This is method, not a physical problem. But also the essence of technology is nothing technical. And this implies that the problem of the ever-increasing predominance of technology can't be solved technically. 
when we start using renewable forms of energy instead of fuel and coal, we don't change anything in our relation to nature at all. For Heidegger, his philosophical task is to draw attention to meditative thinking. This he also tries in his memorial address in Mesquite. He doesn't want to provide answers and take the role of a tutor, both leader and guide, as he did in 1933. Now he's only asking questions. Aside some, if the old groundedness is already lost, would not the new ground and foundation be given back to it? Ground and foundation from which human beings and all their work can flourish in a new way, and even within the atomic age. What would be the ground and foundation for the groundedness? And Heidegger talked about the essence of human beings, mention these, and not about human beings. It's the da of dazzling. It is the clearing within which humans stand out or exist. This da is the ground and soil of a new rootedness. This da is only da, the meditative thinking awakens. This is the reason that what Heidegger is asking is very near, even so near, it is the essence of human being that we overlook it all too easily. The way to this near is the bridge across which we can come to meditative thinking. We should not try to represent the objectivity of the objective world, but pay attention to our most inner and own most essence of thinking. Meditative thinking frees us from representing thinking and bear with from the reality of the technical world. Meditative thinking is a step back into the ground. We can't live anymore without the equipment, appliances, and machines of the technical world. Therefore, it is useless to damn the technical world that we're the better. But still, we shouldn't become slaves of technology. Heidegger's solution is simultaneous saying yes and no to technical objects. It means, on the one hand, we make use of them. After all, we can't live without them, as they should be used. On the other hand, we let the technological objects be, because they should make our life possible and easier of concerning us in our essence. The gravest danger is that we only understand ourselves, technological objects, and forget that technology is only one way of being in the truth of Dasein. Heidegger calls this attitude of simultaneously saying yes and no to technological objects, an old German word, the serenity, Klasenheit, towards. In this attitude, we not only consider things as objects, we discover beings not as objects standing against objects, but also let it be a thing that collects earth and sky, more than God and the purple. But what is the sense of this lingering within the changing attitude of human beings towards nature and world? Heidegger refers here to a sudden change of mono metaphysics, nihilism in the planetary dominance of technology. We don't know when this change will end, because, as he says, the sense of the technical world is hiding. But within the technological world, we are still touched everywhere by meaning, seen when we pay attention to it. This attitude of attentive, attentive achtsamkeit, and meditative thinking, you know, Heidegger calls the openness of the mystery. The serenity towards the things and the openness for the mystery belong together and offer us the possibility of a not only technological dwelling, they also offer us the chance of finding new rootedness and open the realm of new Heimat. The gravest danger of the atomic age is going to Heidegger, not the danger of a third world war, but that calculative thinking, it says, would remain the only valid and practice kind of thinking. Why is this the gravest danger and the most pressing need? Because this would lead to complete and utter thoughtlessness. Okay. Then, Heidegger says, man would have denied and thrown away its almost being, namely that he is a thinking being. That is why it is important to save the essence of human being. That is why it is important to keep thinking awake. When human beings deny their almost essence, they can no longer be things. The world will be definitely and utterly destroyed. The serenity toward the things and the openness for mystery only within incessant heartfelt thinking. That's half the thinking. The thinking shouldn't be rational but heartfelt because it is our own most eigenstein. When the serenity and the openness awaken us, we might find a way that leads into a new native land, Heimat, makes a new rootedness possible.
There is a problem with Inhari's memorial dress that we can easily overlook. It eventually makes the same mistake. Humor. In his address, he speaks the same metaphysical language when he's talking about meditative thinking, although he then is in the realm of another non-metaphysical language. Language of meditative thinking should be a non-metaphysical language. Examples of this kind of language he found in the poetry of Wilberlin, Wilke, Georg, and Trago. Thought for it is in the little sedation of really quick thinking, and he played with it in the so called hints. For example, the thinker is poet, or as the poem we think. Uh, I think I will stop here There's a little bit more, but that, uh, with a few to the time. It's no problem. If you want, you can, can finish the last two pages. That's really no problem. Okay. At the end of this lecture, I will look back on the path of thinking we followed and point to some consequences of Heidegger's way of thinking. Heidegger remained true to the method of phenomenology his whole life. The starting point of his way of thinking is the facticity of Dasein. What Dasein is in each instance mine. Thinking can only meditate its own presence, but it all serious thinking starts with an analysis of its own time. Heidegger interprets the 20th century as the age of the completion of metaphysics. This completion comes to light both in the planetary dominance of technology and nihilism. Nihilism is the final possibility of metaphysics and explains why there has been no new metaphysics in Hegel. The history of metaphysics is, as Heidegger showed in his fabulous interpretation of the history of philosophy, the image of the history of being. The question concerning the supermensch is a question concerning the possibility of another that is non metaphysical. Heidegger interprets each metaphysics as the history of nihilism. National socialism then is the worst possible completion of nihilism. In his talks in Bremen, he gave in 1949 under the title Insight into What That Is, we find two passages that have been criticized clearly. I will cite them both. Thoughts on them. Farming does not challenge the arable land. Rather, it gives the seeds to the forces of the world. Parts them in their prosperity. In the meantime, however, the field cultivation has also passed into the same ordering process, which places the air on nitrogen, the soil on coal and ores, the ore on uranium, the uranium on atomic energy, this on orderable destruction. Agriculture is now a motorized food industry, essentially the same as the manufacture of corpses and extermination camps, same as the blockade and starvation of countries, the same as the manufacture of hygiene bombs. The citing citation, and we hear it for the first time, it's provocative, even shocking. Motorized agriculture is, in its essence, the same as the fabrication of corpses and past genders. How could that possibly be true? Evidently, Heidegger equates agriculture and house. This is not what Heidegger says. Modern agriculture has become bio industry and is a consequence of it. Bio industry animals are objectified and become products. The living animal is nothing anymore. It has become valueless and irrelevant. The production of corpses is for Heidegger the same. We're not just denying the Holocaust. Does the Shoah not lose its uniqueness and incomprehensible? The same, the Selba, it's not a, a, equivalent. On the one hand, the production is the same because they're both consequences of nihilism. On the other hand, and that is decisive, are different. And after which people were reduced of destruction and annihilated. Here, the Shoah is, if you follow Heidegger, the most horrific consequence of nihilism. In this way, it finds its way in history. Nihilism and the dominance of technology is the condition of possibility about which. Heidegger would probably agree with me when I claim the slaughter in the trenches of the First World War was a preliminary stage for us, which is unique, at least let us hope so, and incomparable with other historical events. It is still an integral part of human history. In Heidegger's third talk, we find an important paragraph. There he says, hundreds of thousands die on mass. They die 
you perish, will be killed. They die, they become part of the inventory of the manufacturer. Die. They are quietly liquidated in extermination camps. Even without such things, millions are not perishing in China through hunger. To die means to carry death into one's own being. To be able to die means to be able to do this. We can only do it when our, people, when our being is capable of the essence of death. When mortality belongs to the essence of human being, and in Auschwitz, the victims were robbed of their mortality and thus their humanity. How do you make something important visible? Victims were not just killed, but annihilated in their essence. Precisely this annihilation is mortality, non essence, unwesen of the Shoah. So, that's the end, folks. <laughs> Yeah, Alfred, thank you so much for your talk. That was that was a um, wonderful talk, well structured. Thank you so much. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, um, I will open the Q and A and um, ask for any kind of questions. And um, you can write your question in the chat in the chat box, and mm -hmm. um, you can read it for us, or um, you can just turn your microphone on and. Um, ask a question directly to Mr. Denker. So um, while people might be writing their questions, maybe about the mm -hmm. last two pages, which were a little bit um, provoking, and especially in, in Germany and Europe, these two passages have stirred up a lot of um, controversy. Yeah, but um, let me just give a small summary of, um, of your talk, just to... to mm -hmm. um, um, give the main points. So you started talking about um, Jünger and, and Nietzsche and um, told us about Heidegger's criticism of, of Jünger, um, mainly about the, the point about metaphysics and nihilism, how we are living mm -hmm. right now in the age of the completion of nihilism. And in the beginning already, you raised up the problem of, um, of the language. Um, or maybe the, the question of how to cross the line. Um, do you have to think about the line? Um, so the problem, even then, is the problem of the of the language, the language you use to to overcome um, metaphysics. Is it itself a metaphysical language? Um, then you turn to your know, second section. You turn to technology. Talked um, about the instrumental understanding of technology how Heidegger says that technology is understood as a means to certain ends, but Heidegger teaches us to be aware of the essence of technology as some kind of challenging, um, challenge, challenging everything that is. And pre precisely this question about how can we think about the essence of technology um, was the transition to the next part, his, um, his memorial address, um, for the for the memory of Kreuzer, well, he talks about Gelassenheit. Basically, this this kind of method that also stands for the continuity of Heidegger's thought. I don't know if you agree, but this kind of formal indicative thinking um, of Gelassenheit, um, maybe we find that in the early Heidegger too. Maybe this would be a first question. Maybe you can say something about the continuity of this kind of besinnliches. Um, thinking and yeah in the end um, you brought up this this question again of, about the problem of the metaphysical language um, in his memory address he's he's using this language too you, you said but he's also finding um, new kinds he he's finding hints um, new ways of of talking of thinking um, especially um, with the poets so um this is maybe the way um, of, of being aware to new possibilities of, of thinking of something Heidegger calls letting beings be. And yeah, so the, the first question I would ask, the first question is this about the continuity of Heidegger's thought. And uh, <clears throat> something that I found very interesting is this, um, you kind of contraposed the Heidegger of 19, 33, um, Heidegger of the, the crisis years, the rectorate years, 1993, 1934. Um, and you said 
then in the 30s, early 30s, Heidegger thought, was convinced, maybe he can guide um, the, the, the human people or the philosophers. Maybe the Übermensch is possible, he said. So he wanted to do something. Um, and then you said, but um, 22 years later, um, he completely turned to a more um, meditative kind of thinking, this kind of besinnliches thinking. It's not about actively doing something, but more about giving space, um, allowing things to, sh to show and to talk to us. Um, maybe you can say more about this kind of, is it really, is it a, when was the turning point for Heidegger? Was the, the failure of the rectorate? Um, yeah. So two questions, but also whoever wants to ask a question in the chat or turn on the microphone, feel free to ask okay. any question. Thank you. So now I'll start with your group. Um, uh, I always uh, try to explain it. Uh, that there's a difference between Heidegger's way of thinking, which is from the start to the end. But this way of thinking consists of different paths of thinking. So you will find in Heidegger, he's doing different things at the same time. He's working, uh, you can find it in his, in his early Freiburg Black Records when he's uh, developing a terminology of religion at the same time as trying to find a new understanding of philosophy, what it is, what the possibilities are, as this notion of uh, primal science. Religion. So, and you often will see that he may leave a path of thinking on his way of thinking that he will go back to 20 or 30 years later. And some of these notions that he makes so strong in his later thinking, you can find already in, in being in time. But there he's not developing them. He leaves them in the senses, uh, what you call them, uh, steps maybe. So you find the notion of rightness, you find in being in time, you find the notion of dwelling in being in time. It's not developed in this later event of connection with the fourth world and poetically dwelling and things like that. So it's uh, the difference is, uh, I think, Heidegger originally was uh, following in the footsteps of his teacher, Heinrich Rickert, who was a Neo Kantian, who was developing philosophy as strict science, the same as Huttel was, point of agreement between uh, Huttel and, and Rickert. Although they go different ways in, in other senses. Heidegger uh, started from there. You find this notion of who is in charge of philosophy, it must be a science. And if it's a science, it's a special science. It's not uh, limited to one specific domain of objects like natural science or biology, etc. And he gives up this notion of philosophy as a science. Uh, let's say, a couple of years after uh, he finished being in time, in the first uh, lecture course in, uh, in Freiburg, a successor of Oslo in 1928-29, explicitly says that what we is not a sign. No, it's something he gives up. That's, but he keeps this, the method that he developed, let's say, between uh, 1919 and being in time, uh, Formal indication, it's something I think he kept his whole uh, thing, his whole way of thinking with him. And that's, uh, there is a continuity. And that one of the things, in, if Heidegger is correct in his uh, analysis of nihilism as being the essence of modernity, and in being in time itself, you should be able to find the will to power. I think you can find it in this, uh, the notion in, in being in time of projecting. It's always Dasein projecting an understanding of the world, etc. It's an active. In his later thinking, he, he develops it more like listening, hearing. You listen to what's being said. You're not at first projecting it, but you listen to what beings are saying to you try to cross that in a original way. So 
think there's a, there's a big difference. Uh, then after being in time ended in this uh, the, the ability of finishing the book, probably everybody knows only two divisions of the first part were published. So two thirds of the book was never published. Um, Heidegger begins thinking about the metaphysics of that. And he changes a lot the, the, the structure, the difference between the metaphysics of data and fundamental ontology that develops pretty quickly over a couple of years. But he's then trying to develop a new metaphysics or to retrieve Greek metaphysics in a new original way. And that leads to this uh, notion of the development of, of the new metaphysics uh, being the the fate of the German people who have to be the hence the successors of the Greeks and develop a new understanding of being. And, and there it's, especially in 33, 34, you get a lot of these texts where Heidegger is trying to convince people that we need to, everybody worked hard at it. We can make a new metaphysic, which I think in itself is a problematic notion. And when he starts talking about German Dasein, I think it's also a fundamental mistake he makes. There is no German Dasein, it's only Dasein. It's this universal structure that every human being shares with everybody else on the planet and also through history. Where we can still read texts that were written a couple of thousand years ago. They still speak to us. Yeah. This mortality, for example, it's being in the world. And we're all sharing the world, although we may have different interpretations. One of the important things to keep in mind is being in the world is an empty structure, but it's always actualized in a concrete historical world. So you're born either in Europe, like I am, in, in the Netherlands, or you can be born in, in Beijing, in, in China, and that makes a difference. But we still share this form of being in the world, and that's why we can talk to each other, even if we have different languages. That's why you can't translate from one language into the other, why you can't translate my German text into a Chinese text. And people can understand what I'm talking about, hopefully. So it's, uh, but Heidegger then discovers through this, his reading of the history of metaphysics, that metaphysics itself is, is nihilism in its essence. So his own attempt to develop a new metaphysics is a nihilistic attempt. That's why he gives it up. And then the first thing he starts to do is he had, uh, shifting in 34 when he's starting the first lecture on uh, lecture course on Nudelin. And then followed by the, the origin of the work of art that he's and he never talked about art basically before. The, before. They're starting to uh, deal with poetry and his works of art, like the paintings of Van Gogh, for example. And, He's trying to get away from this, this notion of willing and, and working and doing. And this is when he starts writing uh, the Beitrager or the Contributions to Philosophy as the first attempt to develop a, what he called standard being historical thinking. Uh, as he later will see in the early 40s already, when he starts writing a new book, a new manuscript called uh, The Reichness, even. At, if you develop being historical thinking in contrast to metaphysical thinking, you're still <laughs> attached to the structure of metaphysical thinking. In that sense, it's, it's also a failure that he gives up. And he keeps always trying again in any new ways to find the answers or to at least show where the problems and the questions are. So in the... This later manuscript, he tries to speak from being directly. That's why it's a very difficult text to read, because that's an attempt to do on metaphysical thinking. And you can find it more in a more easy format in uh, the thinker's poet who found the Stenkens, a little book that he wrote in uh, Todnerberg, where you have on the on the left page you have this two lines indicating a fundamental achievement. And on the right side, you have three, four of these uh, hints. Very... And the problem is, if you try to understand the hints or interpret them in a metaphysical sense, they make no sense. 
in a sense, you can only listen to them. And this is, it's a different kind of understanding. It's not through grasping the concepts and the structure, but in the saying itself, it becomes a saying. And that's what he sees, for example, also in early Greek thinking. If you see metaphysics, the history of metaphysics as a whole, and that's only possible at the end of the history of metaphysics. That's why Heidegger was lucky enough to be able to see it. As long as you're within metaphysics, you cannot see it as a whole. 